A good evening. May I introduce you to Quasim Connects. My name is John North, Clinical Director of the Queensland Audit of Surgical Mortality. The Quasim Connects webinar series is a quarterly series presented by surgeons. I invite you as a surgeon to consider presenting to us your personal platform that you may consider worth sharing, or perhaps you have an insight that you may wish to enlighten us about in a specific arena. Anything that will aid our delivery of safe, high quality of care to patients would be acceptable. I invite you to email questions at the end of tonight's presentation and we will attempt to answer them. Thank you. Quasim Connect's speaker tonight is Dr. Stephen Allison, and he will present on the importance of clinical handover. Dr. Stephen Allison is a general and colorectal surgeon who completed his colorectal subspecialist training in 2000. He visits Greenslopes Private Hospital and the Mater Private Hospital. Dr. Allison has been involved in the training of general surgical trainees as a surgical supervisor. He's also involved in a training program for interns and residents, which he helped to set up. He's also head of the Greenslopes Medical School Department of Surgery that organises surgical teaching for the medical students. He believes education and engagement of our colleagues is essential for the improvement of patient care. Thank you, Stephen. Welcome. Hello, my name is Stephen Allison. I am a surgeon at Greenslopes Private Hospital in Brisbane. I was asked by John North, the director of Quasim, to talk about handover. Why have handover? Patients require 24 seven care from the medical teams. We aren't able to be available 24 seven and neither should we be. We need to have dedicated time for rest and recuperation to provide quality of care. Therefore, it requires more than one person to be involved in the patient's care. Therefore, we hand over to other people to facilitate ongoing quality of care. The handover needs to be done to ensure that all issues of management are assessed. And this minimizes the chance of mistakes and under care. And by that, I mean things not being addressed or not being followed through for. This without doubt will ensure the best outcome for the patient possible. There is a lot of literature on the net. If you Google handover, this is a snapshot of from Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. It's a riveting article to read, and I suggest all do so. It is trying to document how handover should occur to ensure that we provide the best care possible. So what is handover? Well, handover depends upon the circumstances of the patient. A handover for someone who is in the ward awaiting rehab or going to a nursing home is different from handover of someone who is unwell having had a multi-trauma or is sick in intensive care. So the severity of the patient's problems certainly mandates the quality of handover that needs to be performed and the information that needs to be passed on to ensure that all issues are being addressed. With regard to the stage of care, I'll go back to the beginning. If they're waiting rehab, then a lot of their acute surgical issues have been managed and we are dealing with less important issues to ensure that ongoing care continues. So from a medical perspective, I'm talking about the doctors handover is on various types. These are just a few. A transfer from one intensive care to a larger intensive care. A transfer from intensive care to the surgical ward. A patient who is admitted through the emergency department acutely and being transferred under the care of the surgical or medical teams. When patients are in hospital, there is the weekend call group that often occurs to allow people to have time away from work with their family to keep themselves fresh and able to perform properly. This requires a handover. The transfer to rehabilitation units from the acute surgical medical ward 
into hospital transfers, requiring all the documentation with the blood tests, the scans, the letters and the phone call. And then the discharge from hospital to ensure that the general practitioner understands what has gone on and the plans moving forward with this by a phone call, if it's going to be a very short time for follow up to the general practitioner or a discharge letter covering all the important issues. Non-medical handover also is important. The nursing staff hand over from a shift to shift of their patients and the issues that are being addressed and managed. We involve allied medical people, including physiotherapy, social workers, dietitians, and occupational therapists to maximize the quality of the outcome from our patients with the treatment they are providing. The discharge planner in ensuring that the information is being passed on to those who are outside hospital. So in the surgical world, who does handover? Well, it depends on who the patient is under. Often in the public hospitals, it'll be the registrars who hand over the patients to ensure that the continuation of the treatment is optimised. In the private sector, it'll be a consultant. It may well be a consultant in the public sector as well. Handover is often in the surgical world, a weekend care or after hours care. Patients will be handed over to a person who will cover a group of surgeons and continue the care of that patient over the weekend to ensure that they remain well and progress forwards looking for discharge. It is important to be able to summarise the current condition. Now, what I mean by that is what operation they've had if they have one, where we are day-wise post-procedure, what are the plans for the situation with tubes they may have, intravenous fluids, a PCA if they still have one, what level of diet are they up to? And how would they progress normally to the next level of diet if they're on fluids? Are there discharge plans over the weekend that are in place or will their patient be in hospital on Monday when the treating team comes back? There needs to be definitive orders regarding resuscitation, arrest calls, transfusions, and transfer to intensive care. Without doubt, Consultants can make the decision about many of these decisions, like intensive care transfer, based on if someone deteriorates over the weekend. But sometimes resuscitation orders and arrest orders need to be in place for someone who has end stage disease, for example, metastatic cancer or end stage organ disease. And if things deteriorate, then we need to know that there is a ceiling of care in place to stop unnecessary treatment. Obviously, this requires conversation with the patient and the family and significant documentation in the chart prior to handing over the patient for the weekend. In the medical world, handover is very similar. They have more important matters regarding resuscitation, arrest orders, antibiotics and intensive care because often their patients are medically much more unwell. Our patients are much well, more well because they have operations. So they need to have boundaries of ceiling of care, palliation versus curative intent. And this is particularly in people with multi-organ failure or end-stage organ failure, and in those who have metastatic disease undergoing chemotherapy. It is important to be able to pass on whether these people have had a family discussion and a discussion with the patient about the expectations of care. So we are not in the situation where someone becomes very unwell over the weekend and the family thinks they're having treatment for cure when it is patently obvious that it is a palliative option which is undergoing with for which the treatment they're undergoing at this stage. Again, the weekend care and after hours care is there. In my hospital, there is a morning meeting on Monday to Friday where they discuss all of the patients that are seen by the medical registrar and all the met calls that are called overnight on all the patients to ensure that the teams all understand who needs to be addressed in the morning earlier and what issues may be out there for the treating teams of the day. Many people have drawn certain diagrams looking at handovers with regard to transitions of care and shift to shift and transfers to hospitals, but essentially 
they've come out with multiple forms and if you google handover forms there are hundreds of them this is the sbar technique so situation background assessment and recommendation and this is the basis of summarizing the patient's situation so they have the information being passed upon to the next team one on the right is a government in hospital transfer for west australia they're all subtly different but they're all doing the same thing and this is one from the imperial college and the nhs of a ed register i hand over to the ward doctors and again, another one from the Birmingham Children's Hospital. As you can see, they're all different, but they're all looking at the same situation of trying to have all the information possible to ensure that the best care can be continued. So what do I think is important with handover? I think it's obviously to start with the patient's name and the age. I think it's essential to discuss the significant comorbidities which are going to impact upon how we're going to look after these patients for the time that we are in charge. We need to know what the current reason for the admission is. If it was an operation, as often is the case in the surgical world, what operation was it and when was it? For example, we are day three post right hemicolectomy, day one post incisional hernia repair. We then need to talk about what the current status is. Often surgical patients will have intravenous fluids running. They may have antibiotics running. <clears throat> they may have a catheter. They may have drains. Where are we going with regard to these tubes, with regard to removal? How are we looking at controlling their pain with their possible PCA if it's still running? Is there a management plan that is put in place by the treating team to transition this patient from their PCA to oral analgesics? If they have an ileus because they've had a laparotomy, do they have an azogastric? What's their fluid status? What current issues are need to be resolved? And by this I mean, if they are having an azogastric, is there a plan for nutrition? Is there a plan for taking the azogastric out? So, as a vignette, this patient's had a right hemicolectomy. From the point of view of the age and the wellness, it's not important at this stage. So they are day three post right hemicolectomy. Whilst this is a colorectal world I live in, this is a general surgical operation. We need to know, we talk about ERAS, so early feeding, early mobilization, but some people progress quickly and some people progress slowly. We need to know at what level we are with regard to their oral intake. Have they progressed from clear fluids to free fluids onto a diet? If they are showing abdominal distension, is it ileus, gastroparesis? Do they have an azogastric in place? And certainly if they have signs of ileus, are we missing early signs of an anastomotic leak? What are the current investigations? A full blood count, ELFTs, and a CRP. We know from the literature that a CRP day three has a great indicative of whether these people are gonna present with an anastomoic leak or not. If it's less than 170, the answer is probably no. If it is over 170, the answer is quite possibly yes. If it is over 170, because we do a CRP, a CRP on day three, they should have a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Has it been booked? Where's it being done? What is the result? What happens if they are longer from surgery? Say this right hemicolectomy person was day seven and they had poor oil intake. We know that somewhere around day seven to 10, people become catabolic. They start breaking down their muscles to build building blocks to, to make things work. To stop the catabolic process happening, we need to give them nutrition. So if they're day seven and I can see them, they're not progressing very fast, I would consider TPN. Has TPN been organized or considered? Have, have you arranged or has the, the treating team arranged central venous access? And in particular in this situation, a PIC line. 
What's their fluid status? We know that people will have significant fluid shifts post-procedure with ileus and things like that. We need to know whether they are uvolemic. It may well be they still have a degree of ileus and therefore they have lots of fluid on board at the wrong places, but we need to make sure that their urine output is reasonable. What fluids are running intravenously to give them a reasonable urine output? And when they have a prolonged ileus, we can use daily weighs to make sure our weight is correct. And if we lose a kilogram, we know we're a litre down in fluids. So in, in summary, handover is an essential part of providing continual care for patients to ensure that the outcome is optimised. It is essential that the current issues are addressed and are passed on in a coherent way such that a management plan can be understood and a plan moving forward will not compromise ongoing care and under treat people. To do this, you've got to be able to provide an accurate summary of their problems and plans. There's no point saying, oh, she'd be right, mate. These people need to be summarized in such a way that we can picture them in our mind and understand all of the issues which may or may not occur over the weekend. Now, I understand that sometimes the wheels will fall off and people will become unwell unexpectedly, but we need to be able to plan for the general situation so the patient get the best care possible. The biggest thing I think is an understanding of the appropriate passing on of information regarding escalation of therapy. The hardest thing I've ever come across as a covering surgeon is seeing a patient who becomes unwell where there is no plan in place with regard to escalation of therapy to ICU, a discussion with the patient or the family about limitations of therapy. Now in the acute surgical world, there is no discussion. We would give people the best care possible. But in the setting of someone who say has metastatic colon cancer and they present with peritonitis on the ward having had chemotherapy, if there's no discussion with the family of the patient, it is very hard to stop therapy. And it's important that, that the team who treats these people has those things in place to ensure that the ongoing care is seamless and supportive. Thank you.